Good morning. My name is Matt Minner. I'm with Catalyst Connection. Welcome to our Aim to Learn session this morning. Today we have our session, uh, No Fear Manufacturing, with John Weinbrenner of Keystone Advanced Innovations. Uh, thanks for joining us, John. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear more from John here in a moment. Uh, but yeah, we're going to you know, touch on improving machining operations through advanced techniques and approaches that John's going to walk through today. And it's really just scratching the surface of a lot of the uh, the very interesting work that John and KAI do with their clients. Uh, but first, just a, a quick uh, refresher on AIM Hire, which is the program that is bringing you the AIM to Learn series. And so the AIM Hire Consortium we're actually in the last month of our three-year program funded by the Department of Defense Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, all focused around strengthening and expanding the defense supply chain in Southwest Pennsylvania and West Virginia, uh, with a focus on the adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies. And just to note, we are uh, anxiously awaiting the response on a proposal to extend our program for an additional three years. So that's on the horizon, and we are waiting to hear more on that, but uh, seems promising. And with all the good work that our partners have done, and speaking of, you can see our 13 partners across the region in the economic development and workforce development space, technology institutes and universities, just really well represented across the region. Some of the other aspects that we've focused on is developing a supplier capabilities database and bringing in suppliers and resources like KAI to, uh, to the region and making sure our, our region's manufacturers are aware of them for collaboration, sharing of opportunities and, and things of that nature. This uh, database is free to join, so reach out if you have any questions. And just lastly, on the, the regional impact that we've been able to have, this is uh, probably a little bit out of date by now, but we've had over $20 million in investments that our manufacturers have done as a re result of the, the program, for $100 million in retained sales, and probably the one we're most excited about, the 750 jobs created and retained. Our Aim to Learn series, we've, I think, covered about this, our 25th session. So it's been uh, very exciting. We're excited to have you on with us today, John. Uh, everyone stay tuned for upcoming sessions. And as always, the recordings are available on demand on our website. So with that, let's go ahead and make John the presenter. And we'll learn more about John, his background, and uh, KAI. So I believe you should, yep, there we go. Looks like you're pulling it together, John. Okay, everybody see that? Yep, that looks good. All right, we'll start off by small introduction here to what KEI does and No Fear Manufacturing. And what we're gonna learn about is to not have any fear as you look at new technology. And some of that's gonna be 3D metal and carbon fiber printing, advanced five axis, custom training and consulting is some of the, the work that we provide. The agenda we're gonna be covering today is gonna to be a small intro to Keystone Advanced Innovations. We are a limited liability corporation. Uh, implementation of state of the market technology. What state of the market is, is current technology that is available. It is not uh, future technology. So you're gonna learn about advanced tooling, which is also state of the market. So they are available. We're not looking at R&D type of tools. Dry machining, how to. Many materials today can be dry machined. And we'll be covering cost savings generated from implementation of some of the newer technologies. And five axis machining benefits. Some other services are going to be custom training programs. It'll be tooling optimization of any tool that you're going to be utilizing and how to optimize it per material. Advanced machining concepts, which is the programming and processing of some of those different types of tools within those materials. We also provide on-site training. We can actually do training here at our facility. 
which is in Export, Pennsylvania, or we can do on-site training custom to your needs and your materials that you currently work with. Turnkey support, we also provide turnkey support where a machine tool could be delivered to our facility. We completely tool it up and do all the processing and any final implementation is completed on site and transfer of that is completed on site here where your uh, operators will attend a session here. We will train them on the whole process before it would be shipped to your facility and implemented on site. We have full process optimization, which is initial testing uh, at KEI. And what we do is we will pull in a particular material that you might be working with and some other tooling. You will not need to shut down your production. We will do some of the process optimization here at our facility and then transfer it to your site. Some of my experience, I've had a, a very fortunate career. I've been quite lucky in uh, 40 plus years, uh, 81 to 94. I was a uh, journeyman machinist at LNS Machine and uh, did a lot of nuclear work at that facility for commercial nuclear fuel, as well as some R&D programs for Westinghouse on a variety of different materials. I was a product engineer at Kennametal from 94 till 2002. I was responsible for solid carbide drills and high speed uh, balanceable tool holders while at uh, Kennametal, as well as many application support type of uh, opportunities. I was an instructor at Kennametal University. I was a member of the cutting edge scientist team that I was privileged to be able to uh, engineer new grades for testing and research in the field. I was awarded three tooling patents, uh, and then I was selected to be moved into a group that was started out of Canada Metal, was the National Center for Defense Manufacturing Machining, and I worked there from 2002 till 2009, and I've traveled a lot with that, that position. Uh, then I was in 2009 to 2014, I was director of product development for Niagara Cutter. And then Niagara Cutter then was purchased by Seco, and then Seco was purchased by Sandvik. And I was rolled into the director of aerospace and composite machining for North America for those two groups. Uh, 2014 to 2018, I was director of product development for Fullerton Tool. It's a smaller family-owned uh, carbide tooling company out of Michigan. And in 2018 to 2021, I was the owner of Optimized Performance Machining. And that particular business was then purchased. By, we were acquired by a major defense contractor. And 2021 is when I started up Keystone Advanced Innovations because I have a passion for this and it changes daily. There's many opportunities to learn every day in our industry. It's because of uh, the number of changes that occur to the technology that we're using every day. Machine tool benefits. These are ones to not ignore. Uh, five axis, you know, five axis or not. Many times companies don't even give a five axis a chance. They look at it and look at a part they've got a manufacturer and automatically assume it, it is not a five axis part. Well, that many times can hurt you because what you have to pay attention to is full five axis parts. Yes, there's very small percentage of them that are truly five axis, but there's a number of them which are three plus two. So now you have access to five sides of a part which can greatly reduce the cost to manufacture that part any handling of that part. You can reduce many components down to just two handlings at one time. Lays, as we start to look at turning, turning is not simple anymore. You choose a multi-axis lathe to eliminate your setups as well, because now you can do a number of milling operations right on the lathe and, and then save a lot of time and uh, cost associated with moving that workpiece to another uh, station to be machined. 
materials, some of the materials that we have worked with, we don't run from any material. We have a number that we're currently working with, uh, working with the CMC materials currently. That's a ceramic matrix composite material. Not sure what that program's for, but they came to us to machine those. Uh, new alloys, you've got titanium, ink and L, stainless, constantly changing. Those are all heat resistant materials, so you have to pay attention to the way you process that material. Composites, they are also heat resistant, but also abrasive because of many of the epoxies used to bond those materials together. Higher silicon aluminums, I'm talking 30% or higher. These type of materials are replacing many of the beryllium aluminum, which is a hazard. It's a health hazard, so they are trying to eliminate it by utilizing higher silicon aluminums. This creates a, another problem for the uh, industry by tool life. Tools don't last very long in those higher silicon materials. Uh, fiber reinforced thermoplastics, they are being utilized a lot more in the industry, especially in the automotive industry. You're seeing more and more of these type of materials used. And then you're seeing a lot more monolithic parts as you see in the lower image, where parts were fabricated and actually riveted together. They are now completely machining those from a solid uh, piece of material. So you have to pay attention to the way you process some of those materials, or you can get into stress-related issues and movement of the component as you machine it. Uh, special tooling cost as related to standard. These many times get overlooked. People will look at a tool and, and look at the higher cost of some of those tools. This example you see here, a special tool at $125, standard tools $55. Cost is related to a linear inch of that tool. You look at the advanced tool in this particular application, it was $5 per part. The standard tool is actually costing more per part, $9.25 per part. So as you get into production savings of over 2,500 pieces, you're looking at over $10,000 in savings. So these are important factors to keep in mind as you choose some of the tools. Another area, cost savings opportunities, as you look at multi-axe lathe operation, you've got that advanced special tool, $100 each. One live station is needed, okay? Because that's very high cost to put those stations on. So the standard tool, three live stations are needed because you have to use three different tools to perform the same operation you're gonna do with the special tool. The special tools, an example is one you see in a picture. It's gonna produce the hole, the chamfer, and potentially the counterbore at the top of that, similar to your porting tools. So as you look at that, that one live station is $5,000 for one tool, okay? If you've got three tools in use, now you're talking $15,000. So you can see the uh, drastic increase in cost just by having those extra heads. Plus, you're gonna open up two spots on the lathe for other type of tooling. So in the savings that you're gonna see from that is gonna be about $10,000 and you're gonna use less live tools, eliminate two extra tools in the process. This is an example of advanced processing. This is a simple pocket, same features programmed three different ways. Process one, runtime was eight minutes and 30 seconds. Process two, six minutes and 35 seconds. Process three was 14 minutes and 25 seconds. That is just the way it was programmed through the CAM software. And this is an example of areas you've got to pay attention to. And it's just a simple click of the button, which changes the way that pocket is processed, whether it attacks the corners immediately, or if it does the pocket in a linear fashion or a spiral fashion, it all makes a difference. And you can see the difference in at runtime. Dry machining. Dry machining is very possible in today's market. 
What has made it very possible is the tank changes to the tooling, changes to the carbide, changes to the edge prep, changes to the coatings on those particular tools. Question, do you need a 15,000 RPM or higher spindle? Well, to answer that is no, you really don't. What it depends on is what diameter tool you need to do that operation, because all you're looking to do is attain higher surface footage, not so much RPM. So as you look at this, the example you see on the right, that's a coated carbide tool, 750 diameter, four flute. It's got inch and three quarter cut, and is using through tool coolant, but we're using air blast through that tool. That's 1400 surface foot at three and a half thousandths per tooth. And the results you can see with coolant, the old way was 300 feet a minute, and they were getting two parts. With air blast, it went to 1400 surface foot, and now they do 10 parts with that same tool because they are not thermal shocking the tool with the coolant. Proper tooling application. This is an area that your uh, CAM guys really have to pay attention to. Anybody doing your processing, your programming, cutter engagement is critical. You do not, as you look at the image down in the right-hand side in the corner, that is 140 degrees engagement. That is what you're trying to avoid. That spikes the tool in temperature. What you wanna do is what's on the left. You wanna control that radially. So you wanna control your cut to about five to 10% of the cutter diameter. That controls the cutting temperatures a lot better, enhances the tool performance and the tool life. This is another area you need to pay attention to as you start to progress into dry machining, the thermal conductivity rates of some of the materials you're gonna be machining. And it's just a general overview and a chart which shows everything in there and you can actually see down on the bottom, tungsten is in there. So you can see it's 94 to 100 on the thermal conductivity. So if you're machining a, a piece of Hastelloy or Inconel, you can see many times your thermal conductivity rates below 10. So what happens is your tool now becomes a heat sink. So it is soaking up a lot of the heat that you're generating in that cut. So this is the rule of thumb to understand what's going on as we progress into dry machining. Here is a thermal evaluation with a camera on it, and you can see the temperature difference. This is radial cut is the only thing that was changed. Same surface footage, same IPR, same axial cut depth. The differences, the one on the top is 5% radial, the one on the bottom is 100% radial. So you can see the difference. Now every degree you're generating there, depending on your material, your carbide tool is your heat sink. So this is what you're trying to maintain and control at this point. Here is a standard chart from a tooling manufacturer that you'd see in a market today. And what you can see is these are stainless because stainless is one of these materials that can be machined dry and very rapidly. This demo parameters you'll see, thousand surface feet, six times higher than what they're recommended on the chart. Feed rates, six times faster. So as you start to look at this, these are areas to pay attention to where we can go above and beyond what's recommended in the book. And it's a matter of not having that fear to move forward. These are some examples that we have completed here. This is an old method. This is a titanium compressor wheel. Uh, there is no splitter vanes involved, so it's a little easier to manufacture. The old method you can see was about 28 hours, multiple tools. The new method now is 14 hours. Annual cost savings was 1.1 million over one year. Titanium machining project and this was a milling project just roughing but their old method they were using an indexable end mill three parts per set 180 surface foot it was about an hour and a half per plate the new method 
took them to one tool, which was a solid carbide tool. And we're now getting nine plates per M mil, 350 surface foot. So your time went down to 20 minutes per plate. Their estimated savings was 675 per year. So these are places by implementing new technology, there's cost savings that can be generated rather quickly. This is just a simple Inconel 718, which many of the market is still using high-speed cobalt because as you get carbide in there, it wants to fracture and different things start to occur that cause tool failure prematurely. This one, the old method was high-speed cobalt. Tool cost was $4.40 each. As you look down below, that tool was costing them 44 cents per part. So as you look at the new method, which they switched to, that tool was $28. So it was significantly higher in cost. But if you look down to the bottom, the overall tool cost was 16 cents per part. So that's where you see your big benefits and the reasons to not be afraid as you progressively look at some of your advanced tools and they do have higher costs associated with them. Turnkey programs. We do support turnkey programs. This is one that we did complete. Uh, went from an old method. They were looking at buying multiple machines. We showed them that the new machine was actually paying for itself rather quickly. Their ROI was one and a half years based on the higher volumes they were able to complete. So their profit margin went up 25% per part on this application. So bottom line, this is uh, where we, we close off, but uh, implementation of new technology is very important as you progressively move forward. And, and this is a big reason here in the United States, if we want to keep something from being offshore or outsourced, one of the ways you can do that in, in your shop is by implementing and not being afraid of new technology. There is there's 3D print, there's their robotic technology, there's many opportunities to start to invest in it. You just can't be afraid of it. You've got to look at it, research it, do your homework, and then start the implementation. That includes a lot of what I've talked about here today. There's cost savings associated with everything. With this, we'll conclude, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone. And here is my contact information. Is there any well, question? You, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, but just first, yeah, thank you for the, the presentation. There's lots of excellent information. Uh, very interesting to, to get into this space. Uh, one question, uh, you talked about the, the heat resistant materials, and I think you started to kind of answer the question as you mentioned it earlier in the presentation. Um, but when you're dealing with the heat resistant materials, which I guess would be more of, I think you mentioned the titanium and tungsten and some others. And so then the, the challenge with that is then it forces the heat back into the tool. Was that the, the gist of that? Yes, the tool becomes the heat sink. So the heat soak is in the tungsten that you're utilizing for the tool material. Many of your materials such as ink and L's, stainless materials, believe it or not, uh, titanium, your carbon composite materials, they are very thermal resistant. That's the reason they're used in the industry. So it creates its own set of challenges as we start to machine those materials. So what sort of different approaches are typical in there? Is that where you were talking about just how you're engaging the, the tool into the part and, and things like exactly. that? Exactly. Exactly. It's a matter of the way you attack the part with the cutting tool. You want to control your radial engagement. You don't want to exceed 20% of the tool diameter. You don't want to engage three teeth in cut. You want to try to maintain two teeth in cut. Every time you engage more of that carbide tool, you're generating more heat, which is causing more problems. So yes, it's very critical how you approach the workpiece. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And I think another thing that maybe a lot of people, especially those that are are limited in their expertise, would you know assume, okay, well, there's 
you know, cam softwares, a lot of this stuff is is automated. Can do that, but is that really the case? Is that do can are cam softwares getting to the point where they can account for some of these approaches at your time where that can be one of the selections or preferences or somehow incorporate those into the CAM softwares or does that require um, more expertise uh, like something that, that you're able to provide and knowing those those intricacies? It's a it's a combination of both. They do permit you uh, different approaches to the workpiece material. Many, many options. As you saw in the one example I presented, you saw the difference in runtime. Well, there's a difference in runtime, but there's also a difference in tool life by choosing the right application. And that's where KEI can really help the, the end user. We can come in and actually do the evaluation for you. And we can also do the evaluation here on, on our site. So you're not shutting down your manufacturing. Yeah, great, great resource. And I think that the last question here, you started talking about automation a little bit. I assume you're, you'd also, you have a lot of experience, um, you know, from the toolware standpoint. So it's from, is it correct to assume that also from the planning when you get into robotic machine tending, especially approaching lights out or doing some off shift work in an automated fashion of helping to plan for toolware or establishing those routines in the, the program that would prevent, you know, things going out of spec yes that's exactly right a, a tool becomes a part of the full automated process because you've got to have control of your process and that tool material is one of those things as well as the processing technique used you've got to have consistent results and consistent performance from the tool if you're going to automate because if you're going to run lights out and you know you can do 50 pieces overnight you want to make sure you can run that lights out with no fear that no mm -hmm. tool is going to wear out prematurely or you're going to have an issue and you're going to come into a, a potential you know shutdown that you're going to have to correct some components and the other thing you're going to have consistent performance of that tool so your quality is going to be much better in that part Fantastic. No, this is all excellent information. Thanks so much for, for joining us today, John. And uh, with that, I want to thank uh, everyone listening out there and those who may have tuned into the recording as well. And uh, wish you all a great day. So thanks again, John. All right. Thank you.